Hi everyone, and welcome to our look at the competition for the 1999 model year. In December, you'll be receiving comprehensive information about the strengths and weaknesses of the 1999 competitors. While that information will give you specific details and head-to-head -head comparisons, this program is going to take a slightly different approach. In the next few minutes, I'll give you my take on a handful of 1999 models. Now, most of them have a lot to offer, but it's helpful if you know some of their weaknesses. I have an insider's look at the competitive field, and I'm ready to share some of what I know with you. So grab your pens and prepare to learn a few things about the 1999 competitors from my point of view. Let's start small with the 1999 Infiniti G20, a four-door entry-level luxury sedan. The G20 offers plenty of fun behind the wheel, if fun is all you seek, but if you want style, power, and luxury amenities, the G20 probably won't provide them. The style is boring with a spoiler on the rear of the touring model that doesn't add a thing. If you can get beyond the looks and get behind the wheel, you'll find the G20 lacks low-end torque. Its small displacement engine doesn't give the driver much off the line and makes city driving somewhat challenging. The lack of power combined with the available automatic transmission makes for a snoozer of a driving experience. A look around the interior reveals many less than luxury items such as two really ineffective cup holders. Ever the nemesis of design engineers, the Infinity folks need to go back to the cup holder drawing board. One of the cup holders doesn't allow for tall beverages, and the other fits into the console so loosely that a tight-fitting cup will actually uproot the whole assembly. Finally, the console itself is inconvenient as well, offering no good spot for a cellular phone or whatever other gadget you might want to travel with. The Oldsmobile Alero moves in to replace the Achieva with a two-door coupe and a four-door sedan. You'll notice its styling is similar to the Intrigue and Aurora. You'll also notice that mechanically, it's really a Pontiac Grand Am. While Grand Am is sporty, Alero is upscale with more refined looks both inside and out. Like Grand Am, Alero has an extremely stiff body structure for precise steering and handling. But if you like driving, you'll be disappointed that Alero offers only a four-speed automatic transmission. Its four-cylinder engine is noisy, and that undermines Alero's sleek image. Other downers include the high trunk opening that makes it difficult to get items in and out. And if you're in the back seat, there's a closed-in feeling, and a rear passenger sitting in the center will feel like he or she is sitting on a brick. The Honda Accord is larger, more powerful, and full of refinement. Now this car is no slouch, but it's not as perfect as some members of the press would have you believe. From a performance standpoint, the four-cylinder engine on some models seems sluggish in the passing lane, and the V6 lacks low-end torque. It's slow off the mark, and it makes the Accord a chore to drive in city traffic. The automatic transmission is slow to kick down on hard acceleration, and it shudders slightly on upshifts. And from a styling standpoint, the Honda Accord is just plain boring. Remember that kid's game, King of the Hill? It seemed no matter how big and brawny the kid at the top of the hill was, you could usually find his weak points and bring him down. Of course, sometimes you can find the weak points and only make him stumble a bit. And the case in point is the 1999 Toyota Camry. It's got a lot going for it, and it's a top seller in its segment. But like the bully on the hill, it does have some weaknesses. For 1999, the Camry is largely unchanged from the previous model year, with the exception of the addition of daytime running lamps and a few enhanced options. That said, Camry is still boring. From the exterior to the interior, the styling is bland. Behind the wheel, Camry offers plenty of power and control with its cushy suspension. But look out for the soft steering. It's very light, which can make Camry difficult to control on damp or slick surfaces. And its original equipment tires don't help in this area either. That soft suspension that some will love also sends jolts into the passenger compartment, even over small bumps. On the inside, apart from the nondescript styling, some of the instrument panel items don't seem to fit well together, and some trim colors don't match up well at all. While Toyota is enjoying a great deal of success with Camry, they've decided to introduce a coupe version badge Solera. The Solera competes against Cougar. What they'll find is somewhat expensive, at between nineteen and $28,000. Like the Camry, Solaris styling is pretty dull with an interior that falls short of this car's price tag. 
The cloth interior looks cheap and the plastic console is flimsy. You've got to wonder why they designed the trunk with such a high liftover, making it inconvenient to load and unload packages. The ride is supposed to be taut and sporty, instead it's somewhat harsh. The rear suspension also contributes to the noise level in the passenger compartment. The 1999 Saab 9.5 is another worthy competitor in the midsize sport luxury sedan segment. It's nimble and agile on the road, but with a bit too much lean in cornering. For those seeking luxury in addition to a sporty driving experience, this Saab unfortunately falls somewhat short. Invite your prospects that might be shopping Saab to closely examine the interior amenities. They'll find that the center console stack contains a stereo and heating controls is too wide. It actually crowds the driver's right leg. The ventilation fans are loud at high speed and the outside mirror controls are small. And for those who enjoy a lumbar adjustment in the seat back, they won't like this one. The adjustment knob is far back, forcing the user to contort in order to reach it. The ashtray is so poorly designed that it's just a slit placed in front of the gear shift that's impossible to use unless you're at a complete standstill. Anyone on the market for a roomier or large car will most likely take a look at the 1999 Chrysler 300M. It's touted as Chrysler's most luxurious sedan. And with this buildup, you'd expect something nearly perfect. Well, the 300M is impressive, but it's nowhere near perfect. It's got plenty of power from the 3.5 liter V6 engine, but whether using the manual feature on the automatic auto stick or allowing the automatic transmission to do its thing, in some models it tends to shudder in low speed downshifts. Customers in search of luxury amenities will find many on the 300M that fall far short. For instance, the air conditioning is inconsistent. You either get blasted out of your seat or there's barely a breeze. The 300M doesn't offer a retained power feature that lets you operate the windows once the ignition is turned off. And the cup holders on this luxury sedan are wimpy and throughout the interior there's a heavy use of thin plastic parts. Chrysler cuts some corners on the interior and it's obvious. From a safety standpoint, customers with little kids should be aware that the safety belts on some 300M models don't hold a child's seat tightly. If a large luxury car is not your customer's desire, and a sport utility vehicle doesn't attract him or her either, then they might be best suited to a station wagon. The 1999 Audi A6 is an all-wheel drive luxury wagon with a price tag that doesn't tell the whole story. For instance, its base price is about $37,000, but you need to add at least $3,000 in options if you want leather, deluxe sound system, other typical luxury amenities. If you look at what most people will end up ordering, you might as well set the talking price for the A6 at around $40,000. For that money, you do get a vehicle that can hold its own on the open road and looks pretty good, but you won't get one that will help you drive through city traffic. The A6 lacks low speed power, so it's not quick from a stop. Most of us spend a lot of time in city traffic, so a sluggish A6 could be frustrating rather than a satisfying driving experience. Well, moving from cars to minivans, let's begin with the 1999 Honda Odyssey. It's got the only four-wheel independent suspension available on a conventional minivan. It handles well and has plenty of power, but at the same time it has its flaws. One of the reasons people purchase minivans is for the room and the convenience of having different seating configurations. Like other minivans in the segment, the Odyssey allows the owner to move the seats around. Well, that's easier said than done. These seats are heavy and they're awkward and take a real effort to move them into the configuration that you might want. You'll want to tell your prospects who may be looking at Odyssey to actually try to move the seats around. Let me tell you, they won't be pleased. They probably also won't like the lack of choices for Odyssey, just two trim levels in four colors with no available leather. Other annoyances include automatic temperature controls that actually work best when they are controlled manually. Finally, a security concern is the mini spare located under the floor between the first and second row seats. Once again, you have to go through some rather aggravating maneuvers to get the seat out of the way to access the spare. And after that, you can't put the flat in the same compartment. Honda gives you a bag to store the flat in, in the rear of the vehicle. Bottom line, the conveniences that you'd expect in a minivan are actually bothersome in the new Odyssey. 
Which brings us to another worthy competitor, the 1999 Chrysler Town & Country Limited. Here's a front-wheel drive or all-wheel drive high-series minivan that presents quite a challenge to the other players in the segment. For 1999, it offers improved performance and upgraded handling. Some of its most obvious weaknesses are found in the interior. Once again, the interior is where a minivan should excel, but even the town and country has its drawbacks. The interior styling is heavy on imitation suede and fake wood mixed with leather. The standard middle row bucket seats don't slide forward or back, making it difficult to get to the third row seats. Front seat travel is limited, making this an uncomfortable ride for tall drivers and passengers. Another limit to comfort is the steering column adjustment. It doesn't telescope toward or away from the driver, it simply tilts with wide spaces between settings. Some town and country models windshield wipers don't quite clear the windshield in a heavy downpour. Finally, the stereo system may look upscale, but it puts out only ordinary sound with aggravating controls. Okay, let's journey up the automotive food chain to the next big fish, the sport utility vehicle. The Lexus RX 300 is a mid-sized SUV offering either front-wheel or four-wheel drive. The RX 300 is full of contradictions. For example, its capable engine delivers plenty of power when needed, but at idle or when running slow, it's noisy. The standard automatic transmission on some models stumbles when downshifting. If your customers are considering a luxury sport utility to get them down a dirt road, the RX 300 won't be the best choice. When traveling over bumps and gravel, the suspension all but disappears. Off-pavement stones hit against the body, sending tiny pinging noises into the passenger compartment. A look around the RX 300 interior reveals other troubling items. For instance, the rear seat has to be moved forward in order to get a seat belt tight around a child's safety seat. However, with that seat forward, it makes it difficult to maneuver in front of the rear seat or to adjust the front seat back angle. In winter weather, you can overheat in the front seat because the optional front seat heaters are too hot and can't be turned down. The stereo and climate controls are just plain confusing, and adding to that disarray is a 5.8-inch TV screen in the middle of the dash that's there for future use of a navigation system. This is an SUV that's clearly geared more toward a car driver than a truck driver. Its cargo space is lacking compared to Mountaineer, which takes the utility out of the RX300 SUV. But for people who want the image of a utility and will never take the vehicle off-road, then the RX300 might be their cup of tea. After all, it's built on the ES300 underbody, so it rides like a car but looks like a truck. Confusing. That's the best way to explain the appearance of the 1999 GMC Denali. It's a full-size luxury sport utility positioned to be the Cadillac of full-size SUVs. Here's the confusion. Denali is nothing more than a tricked-up GMC Yukon with a very hefty price tag. And Cadillac has its own luxury full-size utility, Escalade, which is really the Denali in just another set of clothes. Just imagine how confused luxury utility customers must be. Since the Denali and the Escalade are virtually identical, and since we have limited time, let's focus on Escalade. This Cadillac has its own share of problems. To begin with, it's based on dated hardware. By that I mean under this skin, this SUV is nearly identical to the Chevy Tahoe and GMC Yukon, which were introduced in 1992. And those trucks are based on full-size pickups that were launched in the 80s. Friends, that's old. The Escalade's V8 engine is the least powerful and lowest tech in any Cadillac. It's actually the engine you'd get in a Chevy work truck, a 5.7 liter V8 pushrod design. This is a noisy engine that is constantly pushing itself in order to move the bulk of this SUV, which weighs 1,500 pounds more than any other Cadillac. The Escalade also lacks the luxury memory features for the seats, mirrors, steering wheel, and radio that are so popular in this segment. Escalade just doesn't have enough to be a real Cadillac. If your customers are shopping the new Jeep Grand Cherokee, ask them one question. Are you a risk taker? This is a utility that Chrysler says is completely overhauled in every respect, and that includes their brand new 4.7 liter V8 engine. And despite the overhaul, it's remarkably similar to its 1998 predecessor, although last year, Grand Cherokee had more cargo space. 
The 99 still offers cramped quarters for people and their stuff. The rear cargo room is shrunk to just 39 cubic feet behind the rear seat. And if you fold the seat down, you get 72 cubic feet. We simply have more room. Now, Jeep says the cargo space is actually more versatile in the 1999 because the spare tire is moved to under the floor inside the vehicle. To do that, however, they had to reduce the size of the gas tank to just over 20 gallons from 23. If the cramped interior weren't bad enough, the Grand Cherokee still hasn't strayed from the orange tone imitation wood throughout the interior. Grand Cherokee drives reasonably well, but the 99 keeps the old recirculating ball power steering, which doesn't offer the sporty control of our rack and pinion. Well, that's just part of the competitive picture for the 1999 model year, but it should give you some good information to start with. Be on the lookout in December for the complete competitive comparison. It'll be your best resource for the latest information on the 1999 competitive field. I'm Jerry Conover. Thanks for spending a few minutes with me, and good luck in the 1999 selling season.